Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 844. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 20th, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another episode of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down and talk about the news we like to read and tell you about. I, he's got his webcam on. I got my webcam on. We have a super secret software. I press the record button and boom, the, the rest is history. If you like what we do here on Anglican Unscripted, it would really, really help if you click the like button, if you see us. Uh, this episode on Facebook or YouTube. It helps uh, with the algorithm where they try to find out uh, just by scientific uh, uh, thumbprints who likes an episode and who doesn't. So that helps us a lot. It's free advertising. Please go to the comments section. Uh, the comments for the last 10 episodes have just been amazing. You guys are really involved in the program. You help us a lot by telling us what you think and where we may be wrong, but we really aren't wrong. And we really appreciate that. If you're not subscribed to the program yet, and 28% of you have not, click that little red rectangle, click the bell that shows up after that, and you will be instantly notified every time there's a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. And if you want to listen to the podcast, you don't want to see our faces, which, you know, I'm sorry we're so good looking. But if you don't want to see our faces, please cl uh, go to the uh, uh, notes, show notes and you can find a, a link to the podcast. We have a volunteer who uploads the podcast every week and it helps us a lot. All right, George, let's move on to the, uh, well, no, I, we usually talk about how we're doing. How are you doing today, George? I'm doing great. You know, it's Lent now, and those who are longtime viewers will know that I detest Ashes to Go. You know, that's where people <laughs> in the Episcopal Church will stand at train stations and at street corners and just randomly, you know, <laughs> dab ashes on people. It's, a, uh, it's another tech innovation. Well, for me, it's a big, you know, I, I, I think there's more to it than just walking around proclaiming your piety in public. Uh, but I do a, I do several Ash Wednesday services, uh, uh, three in the church, uh, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, two in the church and three in area nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And I had a really exciting, I was just in a great mood and I was exuberant and I loved, I love the, I just love my ministry. I love my life, but uh, that God has given me. So I was in a up mood and I'm doing ashes and it's towards the end of the day and my energy levels are high and I give a, a, I think, a upbeat, positive sermon and for Ash Wednesday about, you know, you need to confront your sin and all this and that, you know, stuff I love to talk about. And then we come to do the ashes. And I have a lovely little lady come up, hobbling up with her walker. Don't take time. Everybody's watching. And I decide, oh, I'm going to really be all Billy Graham-ish and uh, do this. Uh, so, <laughs> dust thou art, and I smudged her up her forehead for the because uh, I like to go up in, in my movement and then across. Sure. Well, I went a little too far, and I caught my thumb under the hook of her wig, and it popped off, and it must have been held on by springs, because this thing shot backwards like six or seven feet. And it looked like a small dog had uh, entered into the nursing home. But everybody was really polite. Nobody really said anything. Just... And so, you know, I scrambled around, had the wig, and helped her put it back on and fit it back That's on. sweet. We did the next person. And for the next person, uh, they, they, they kept the hand on their hair, but I decided to go down stroke and across. Things you learn. It took me 30-plus years of ministry <laughs> to figure out not to do it that way. But there yeah. you go. Catch up with the times, George. It's always down and across. <laughs> oy, oy, oy. So uh, my uh, priest, my the wife of my priest had a baby on uh, Ash Wednesday, and he didn't show up for the service. So it was a... a, a nice, <laughs> Talk him his pay, Kevin. Come <laughs> on now. It was a nice lay-led, uh, uh, as-you-go service. It was kind of cute. Uh, but uh, that 
that's an interesting thing that happens when you go to a, you know some church plants now. You have young families leading the church, and boom, all of a sudden, you, this is the first time I've shown up for the service, and the priest had to go to a hospital for his own birth. You know, it was kind of cute. So uh, congratulations well, you know, to. Uh, I had, I had one of those ministry moments where, like, you sometimes you know priests always feel sorry for themselves. We feel yeah. unappreciated, underpaid, and so on and so on. Well, I had something happen on Ash Wednesday that if that's all that happens in my ministry, I know it's been a success. Sure. I have a lovely little girl named Zoe. She's about 11 or 12 years old. Beautiful, you know, blonde little girl, tiny little girl. And she was at Ash Wednesday service, the, the evening service. And, you know, Ash Wednesdays do not really attract the kids, uh, especially in an older congregation like this. You know, it's dinner time. You know, they got homework, whatever. So, so Zoe is the only little child at this evening service. And after the service is over, I go up to her and said, well, thank you for coming, Zoe. Basically, I asked her, did her grandmother make her come? She said, no, I got in a fight with a girl at school today, and I said bad words to her. And I apologized to her, but I really felt I needed to get right with God. And, I, and Miss Susan, the Sunday school teacher, my wife, okay. Yeah. In the South, they call, you know, all teachers miss, miss no matter yep. what they are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really needed to come and ask God for forgiveness. And she said, and Susan was saying that, Miss Susan was saying that I can talk to you and give make a, a confession. Wow. And, and <laughs> I said, certainly, go, go, let's go, go off. And, <laughs> and uh, so, but what it was, was, you know, her conscience was pricked and the only by her guilt and the only way that she could get right was to talk to God about this. And I'm just thinking, if all I've got to account for in my ministry when I retire is this one little girl starting down the path, then that's enough. That's enough. The church, you know, we may talk about the Episcopal Church going to hell in a handbasket and the rate of acceleration is increasing. But so long as there are little girls like Zoe out there, little boys who the faith will be carried forward. Absolutely. I'm excited. But we live now in a culture where shame is a bad thing. Shame must mm. be uh, be confronted as a phobia. And, you know, we, we've been talking down shame. Where in the Christian life, shame is a good thing because it's an, an, a way to identify where you are walking away from God. Where you mm -hmm. are uh, causing uh, certainly a bad, rep uh, a, a bad representation of yourself. And shame was designed to be good. The Holy Spirit, uh, you know, uh, speaking to us uh, is always meant to improve us and show us a way to repentance. Absolutely so, right, Kevin. So, but now in 2024, oh, shame bad. All right, let's move on here. Oh, talking about shame. St. Patrick's is feeling a little bit of shame. St. Patrick's is in New York City and uh, they held a funeral recently and they discovered that the funeral was for a uh, prostituted, transgendered person of much fame. And uh, they didn't do their research, and they're a little embarrassed. And if you watch the right social media, it was a bad two weeks for the church, George. No, Kevin, I will, I will argue this point with you. It was a great two weeks, a uh, week for the Episcopal Church Episcopal and the Church, Church of England. Miserable week for the Roman <laughs> Catholic Church. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, what have we had for months? We've had the rave in the nave coming mm -hmm. up in Canterbury Cathedral. Yeah. We're middle-aged women, middle-aged uh, women. Friends, I'm sorry. I did not remember it as come on Eileen. All those years, I must have had too much beer. I thought it was Irene, but there again, the well, 80s are it, blurred it, for it, much it, of my It's life. the spelling. The spelling is what throws an American off. It's E-I-L-E-E-N. And that's going to throw us off here in America. Yeah. yeah. Well, well. so the, all these rather tipsy women dancing to come on Irene uh, was a great hit in Canterbury Cathedral. And the Catholic press just had a field day. Their petitions, you know, returned the cathedrals to who they rightly belong when they were stolen 500 years ago. And we'll use the church for what it was meant for. And then out of the heavens, we have a transvestite funeral at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. 
with Canterbury Cathedral engaged in bad taste. The transvestite funeral was a deliberate mocking of the church and its, yeah. and its rights and its beliefs. And somebody did not do their homework when they basically said, because you just can't walk into a cathedral and say, I'd like to have a funeral, please. In other words, you have to be connected. You have, in other words, there's got to be some connection. There has sure. to be some, yeah. you know, you just don't get walk-in traffic because cathedrals and cities are busy places. Mm -hmm. But somehow or another, nobody, somebody didn't do their homework. They had uh, a deliberate defamation, uh, desecration of the cathedral through this service. Uh, the cardinal ordered a mass of reparation where they, in essence, cleansed the place afterwards. But I got to tell you, Kevin, it was a wonderful news for me because now those people who say, give it back to us Catholics, we can make sure nothing bad happens. All I have to do is point to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. And we know that no one church has got, got it all down right. No, no. In fact, St. Patrick's set the bar pretty high for, for flub-ups. You, mm -hmm. you know, here I always thought the, the clown Eucharist was pretty high and some of the other uh, unique things the Episcopal Church has done, but this, this takes the cake for at least a decade. I hope. My hope is that we don't find anything worse in the next couple of years, well, but you never know. We've got an exciting year ahead in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. Evidently, the company that put on the Canterbury... A uh, rave in the nave, a disco, al fresco, or whatever they wanted to call it, has signed up. I believe the number is fourteen other cathedrals in the Church of England to do this over the coming year because it made money. Made money. Yeah. It brought people in. It brought in foot traffic, hmm. and it and the attitude that any publicity is good publicity, so that hey, you know, the people down at the pub, ah, oh, we might as well go to that. You know, we've you know maybe maybe when on a school trip once or somebody got funeral to the cathedral we might as well might as well check it out again it worked for canterbury they did the foot traffic was delivered they got money for it and now we've got 14 other places but you know i, I there's one thing i want to add i just saw this little ad canterbury cathedral is now advertising a deluxe as they like to pronounce it a holy week uh, time a four star accommodations at the retreat house, uh, three star meals, private time with the dean and the Archbishop of Canterbury, all for 950 pounds per person for four days. Uh, what can one say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 900, now, if you don't well, have on. 950 pounds, just go to Holy Week services at your local church. But if you want, I, I don't know whether you get foot massages during uh, as, during the uh, Monday Thursday service, I don't know. Well, they're I selling mean, private comp meetings with the dean and the archbishop, and you get speakers, and you get you know three star hotel accommodations and food and everything. But if at the end of this time. They offer you a service of confession. Is this not just giving penance, which Luther complained about many, many years ago? Has has the church returned to the the early Roman Catholic teaching of uh, pay for penance? Hmm. Well, now we have pay for pray, pay for pray, for, for, at yeah. Canterbury Cathedral at nine fifty pounds a night. And I don't know if that includes VAT or not. But oh, I'm sure you <coughs> They oh must offer gift certificates in the, in the, the cathedral store. By I'll, put up the, right. I'll put up the advert on Anglican Inc. Because I know people won't believe me, but it's a bona fide <laughs> advertisement. Okay, well, the Church of England is having a general synod this week, and they're going to uh, talk about raising pensions. And if you're a Church of England priest, you are, yes... I make no money right now. I need a, a pension when I retire. They're going to go from the the proposal is to go from half pension to two thirds pension, which is cool. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, what else are you going to talk about? Oh, they're going to talk about something called L L F, George. And uh, let's see how that happens it, with that. Ian Paul has a private member's resolution coming before synod, which really is the work of synod should be doing. Mm -hmm. 
Church of England clergy are notoriously underpaid, notoriously underpaid. And one at a time they had decent parsonages and they had decent incomes. If you compare the place in the 19th century and even the early 20th century before the war to what it is today. But when churches turned over their glebe lands and monies to a central administration, ever since that point took happened, the pay of the clergy has not kept pace with the cost of living and housing. So clergy really are very badly served by the Church of England. And a few years ago, they reduced the pension amount. Well, the church commissioners have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. They'll throw 50 million pounds away on reparations or to the West Indies, uh, or they'll do net zero so that contractors will make a boatload of cash for putting in solar panels on churches that nobody attends. And now they're basically saying, okay, you're getting a 12,000 a year pension, we'll up it to 16,000. You know, the amount of good that would do to help uh, the clergy, you know, people are living longer, the cost of housing is astronomical, um, it's just the right thing to do. Will they do it? I don't know. Okay, but then, of the, course, then the, they've the got the fun stuff to that, talk about, LLF. Yeah, well, they're not known for doing the right thing the recent uh, 20 years. So, yeah, LLF is come, coming up again in conversation. I don't know why, because did they not pass part of LLF last time? Do we not have blessing of same-sex uh, couples allowed by the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. In principle, but not in practice. Ah. Meaning, meaning, they by the skin of the teeth, the LLF stuff got through, and then Justin Welby began to walk stuff back by diktat from the College of Bishops, and meaning from he, from him, and the blob that runs the Church of England. And I will say, I believe firmly in my heart, though I have no evidence, that this is the Nicky Gumbel effect. Remember, we reported that when Nicky Gumbel went to the Global South Anglican Archbishops meeting uh, last summer in Cairo, last summer, last fall in Cairo, yeah. he told the gathering there that he would tell Justin Welby, who he knew quite well, that he would bring legal challenges to all of these changes. And it would not stand, and the Alpha Movement and the Evangelicals would, this was the line in the sand for them. And questions were asked in Parliament uh, by Ben Bradshaw, the uh, gay MP who likes to talk about church affairs. Has the Church of England been sued by Nicky Gumbel and company? No, it hasn't. So that basically we've heard nothing. But what we have seen is everything that Gumbel and company has pushed for has happened. In other words, a separate accountability, a separate, basically a third province. Synod voted that down. Welby's now talking it up. Uh, no gay blessings, standalone blessings, until such time as we have pastoral accommodation laid out for people who won't, don't want to do that. That wasn't part of the deal. And so now, L so that the left is furious, has been livid about all of this, and of course, we had the blow up over the two new bishops, uh, Helen Ann Hartley, Newcastle, and Martin Snow of Leicester. Uh, now take this ball forward. Helen Ann Hartley resigned because they gave her a theological advisor that she had no role in picking, and he was conservative. So Snow stayed, and now they have a liberal theological advisor who goes along with the conservative. Oh, by the way, the woman who wrote the, the forward to the Pilling Report is the liberal well, theological advisor so oh, we know wow. where that's coming out <laughs> yeah we do so martin snow put out a letter martin snow is the bishop of leicester and he's the one that held on to the job and he basically put out what i call an american parlance a rodney king letter why can't we all just get along that these are proposals not the final thing that this is a way forward not the way forward and all the official languages that we want to be rebuilding trust in the Church of England with each other. That's the official news and word, but I got to tell you, Kevin, I don't see that happening. I no. don't see that happening. No, not at all. I mean, they, they broke trust just in, in the 
in the buildup to LLF. This was, you know, certainly before the the bishops for at least uh, eight, 18 months, 16 months. And uh, in that mm -hmm. time, you know, they, they failed to keep us informed of what was really going to happen. We're just talking in Daba. No big deal. You guys don't, don't freak out. Nothing's going to really happen to the church. And we certainly aren't going to change our doctrine and discipline. Don't worry about that. And they haven't, to their credit. However, we, we saw pictures of where it's happening in churches in the Church of England. Well, sadly, the Church of England is going the way the Episcopal Church in its management, in that it's moving into pure power politics. Church of England had been known more than so than the Episcopal Church for basically trying to follow its rules and following theological principles. But with the publication of the General Synod papers ahead of this Thursday, I think it starts Thursday night or Friday morning, General Synod, uh, Andrew Goddard uh, has done a deep dive into all this, and basically he's found evidence of malfeasance on the part of the management. Now, who the management is, nobody wants to say, but he has a big paper, which we've reprinted in part on Anglican Inc., where he basically says that there is proof that the uh, College of Bishops concealed decisions from General Synod, that the College of Bishops uh, concealed advice it had received on LLF from General Synod. Legal advice. And it mis mi yep. It misled General Synod. It disregarded General Synod's votes. Mm -hmm. It decided without sufficient information or contrary to the advice they were given. In other words, the bishops went this way when the lawyers said, don't do that. It voted, the, the bishops voted to break the commitments and obligations it made, including those concerning law and doctrine. And they ex ignored, uh, Andrew Goddard writes, their own decisions as House of Bishops in order to get this through. And... At this stage, the conservatives have always been furious about this. Now, the liberals are furious because they have been lied to, they have been misled, and it's now all getting tied together with the abuse scandal because the even though they've got nothing to do with each other, the, the blob that has been hiding and prevaricating on the reports on abuse within the Church of England is now hiding and prevaricating on the LLF process. So the, there was Martin Sewell, who is a member of Synod and an advocate for the abused, has had an exchange of correspondence with the Archbishop's Council demanding transparency. And one of the issues he raised is, well, how do you discipline members of Church House when they obviously go against the decisions of General Synod? Well, that's secret. We can't tell you. Uh, in other words, we're getting into good old Soviet-style politics that, you know, rules and laws are for other people. It's just what the great and the good decide. Well, that's what happens, George, when you try to sell snake oil as an innovation within the church. LLF, for all intents and purposes, is a modern 2024 snake oil. And in order to get people to buy it, you have to lie. You have to cheat. You have to deceive. And you have to tell them it's not snake oil it's something completely different and it will heal you and it will make you better it will make your old grandma younger it will make your young uh, kids wiser and it's not any of that it's deceit god can't bless it the church can't bless it it should be a non-discussion to make it a discussion you need to lie and this is what happened we, we've so we've been sold snake oil george kevin you're absolutely right you got it. You nailed it in one. Okay. So let's, before we move on, Justin has found himself between a rock and a hard place. He has for the longest time uh, been on the right side of the issue 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. When he became the Archbishop of Canterbury, he started to slowly change his position on the issue of same-sex blessings and same-sex marriage to the point now he has to decide whether he's going to support the Orthodox and the Evangelicals or continue to support the Liberals. Everybody's mad at him, which is good. He has to make a decision. Who's he, who's he going to start rooting for? And we'll have to see what happens in the near future, George. I'm a little frightened, though. Um, a statement was put out by eight, signed by eight bishops, 
of the Church of England on uh, an orthodox way forward, small o. And this has gotten no traffic on Anglican Inc. It's got really no discussion. There are no comments about it. And it's a very powerful statement. This could have been written by the ACNA or by GAFCON. It, it's a wonderful paper. Um, lead author was Jill Duff, Bishop of Lancaster. As evangelicals, Paul Williams. As Anglo-Catholics, Martin Warner. Mm -hmm. And they say they represent a larger number of bishops in the College of Bishops, House of Bishops. But it's gotten no traffic. It's gotten no buzz. Now, is that because there's exhaustion? People don't care. They think the battle's over. Or they're more interested in short-term tactical wins than strategically turning the ship of the Church of England around. I don't know, but usually I can sort of tell what's hot and what's not by viewership. And, you know, this isn't, you know, a fire in Bat a fire at an Episcopal Church in Baton Rouge has got four or five times the viewership than a major statement by bishops of the Church of England. Well, I would notice that uh, Church House and Archbishop of Canterbury haven't responded to it. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a strategic tactical position called ignore it. Okay, that's what the Episcopal Church and uh, the Church House has done with, with like the Anglican TV. As far as the Episcopal Church is concerned, Anglican TV and Anglican Unscripted does not exist. If you hear something out in the wilderness, it's incorrect. It's just Kevin and George uh, bloviating on their little webcam show, and they're nobodies. And... Uh, don't, don't worry about them. And if you do the same with these eight bishops, uh, you know, what statement are you talking about? I, I didn't really know a statement. You ignore it. You don't have to respond to it. And you just hope it goes away. And I think that's the desire here of the leadership of the uh, Church of England is, you know, okay, we got a few naysayers. But, you know, in the end, LLF is, is here to stay. Yeah, that's... One way of doing it, let me find the show notes here. Did we talk? Yeah, we talked about that. Um, we talked about that. We talked about that. Uh, oh, and you, you, we're going to talk about the church in Leicester, Leicester wants to permanently hang a gay flag within their church. And uh, I mean, if I go to the Episcopal Church or uh, portions of the Methodist Church, any denomination here in America, I would permanently see from church to church, from time to time, a rainbow flag in a corner or uh, back over the balcony or, sadly, on the altar. Uh, I know some Lutheran churches that have it on their, their altar. And I don't see what the big deal would be for a church in Leicester not to have a permanently displayed rainbow flag torch. Well, uh, legal challenge was brought to this because they're calling it a frontal. Uh, altar linens, a rainbow flag with a cross interwoven into it. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, three people brought challenges. I, one was Brett Murphy, who's now in the Free Church of England. I think it was Brett Murphy. One was uh, Ian Paul, who I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier in the show, and a third challenge was brought. And the chancellor of the Diocese of, uh, of Leicester held a consistatory court uh, meeting and basically ruled that they had the right to bring this challenge and that they were right to object. And they found that the gay flag was basically political symbolism and have, and it's not appropriate to have, now, maybe if you're going to have a gay themed Eucharist, you can bring it out. Well, in the Episcopal Church, that would be 365 days I was gonna a say, year. It, it, yeah. That's permanent in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but you cannot have it as a permanent frontal, you know, during a season of the year or something because you're in a permissibly mixing political issues with the uh, whatever you think is happening at the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass or the celebration of the Lord's Supper. You cannot do that in an Anglican church. Well, how about and, for the month of June? June is Pride Month. Could they do it for the month of June? Uh, they probably can wave flags and have this and that, but they cannot sort of tie it into mm -hmm. the sacrifice the eucharist the lord's supper in other words here's the here, in other words there's a theological issue here that you know it's one thing to basically have uh, you know 
Justin Welby just gave a racial justice sermon, which is his, you know, crazy wokeness. Don't believe me, folks. Read it because it gives us clicks, but don't read it for information. <laughs> uh, you know what it says. Um, you know, you're, it's permissible to do stuff like that. But when you basically make it part of the fabric of the life of the church, what you're doing is you're aping the Nazis. When uh, in, in during the uh, Hitler era, 33 to 45, when most Protestant churches were amalgamated into a single German church, and they had uh, Nazi swastikas and you know Nazi flag altar frontals, they had swastikas uh, or carved into the uh, pulpit uh, fabric and the fabric of the church. And I'm not equating the gay movement with Nazis, far from it, but the principle is the same of taking a political issue and seeking to tie it into the church, which is wrong. I remember a movie called Sound of Music where Christopher Plummer walks out of a building in his, uh, his country and sees a Nazi flag, pulls it down, and, and rips it apart. Why aren't we doing that in the church? I happen to read a fascinating little book. I have odd choice in literature, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I read a book the other day about the Norwegian church during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. When the German Germans occupied Norway, uh, they began to introduce all the race laws and all the stuff that was on the ground in Germany. The Germans treated the Norwegians much better than they did, say, the Poles, because yes, they, they considered did. them fellow Aryans. Mm -hmm. But they still introduced all this stuff. And that included changing some of the doctrines of the Church of Norway, uh, basically eliminating the Jewishness of Jesus. Well, every single bishop of the Church of Norway resigned, and 775 out of 850 Norwegian pastors refused to go and use the new liturgies being put forward by the Nazi-controlled church minister in Oslo because they felt it was an affront to God and they would not cooperate. And some of them wound up getting sent to Auschwitz and some of them died. In other words, we can look to the 20th century for martyrs of the faith, not just to Africa and uh, China and places like that, but to basically comfortable people, middle-class people like you and me, Kevin, who, when the crisis came, and we're dealing with Nazis, we're not dealing with uh, nice people, they made a stand and they stood for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, Bonhoeffer was not the only clergy person to, to be executed and murdered by uh, Adolf Hitler, indeed. All right, let's move on. I got these stories kind of mixed up here. Let's go on to the, the Church of Nigeria. Uh, wrote a communique after its recent convention and obviously addressed the prosperity gospel, something rampant in Nigeria. Uh, but if you read between the lines and you read that uh, uh, statement up and down, I see no mention of the Global South, of GAFCON, of the new Paul Donison. Um we mentioned this a long time ago, right after GAFCON formed and the primates went back to their countries and had to deal with internal issues that GAFCON itself would kind of struggle that way. And that mm -hmm. because uh, GAFCON was not written into the bylaws of these provinces, uh, if you changed an archbishop, you may lose uh, GAFCON support from that province. And that's happened, Tanzania and other places. There's a structural issue in this that it's going to be hard to overcome and you're not always going to see the support you want at a GAFCON level or at the Global South level from provinces that are st stuck dealing with all these eternal issues. I'm glad they, they're attacking prosperity gospel. It's run rampant in uh, African countries and um, it, it's probably one of the biggest concerns they have other than the, the concern of Islam. There's another concern because of the violence of Islam. And it's not too big a deal that GAFCON's not mentioned, but GAFCON's going to be feeling like, well, what the hey? We're, we, we did all this work for you, not even a hey, buds, you know? So I don't know. That's just my opinion. Uh, Kevin, I think you've got, I think you got your finger on the pulse. 
this is not a criticism of what was written. Mm. The communique, which was a, the, the stand, they call it the standing committee, where they have yeah. bishops from every diocese and some representatives, chancellors, things like that. It's akin to a convention, but it's not the same thing uh, or a synod meeting. They, but they have them more frequently. And this put down statements on corruption, on the economy, on the need for a new constitution for Nigeria. And because what are the what are the issues facing the average bishop or average parish pastor or person? It's crime. It's, you know, the, if you're in certain parts of the country, it's risk of death at the hands of Fulani Muslim terrorists. In other parts, it's kidnappings of by bandits who seek to have anybody who has money, they kidnap and extort money from several bishops. We report every time a bishop gets kidnapped, he always gets released, but the Church of Nigeria has to fork over cash. Mm -hmm. um, what is the problem facing the average Nigerian pastor? If he's not on the front lines with Islam, he's on the front lines with Pentecostalism and the Pen prosperity gospel. The economy's in a free fall. There's massive unemployment. That's why all these young people are moving you see all these Africans on the, uh, they save up their money, get a ticket, and are on the border in Tijuana waiting to get into the U.S. Yeah. for economic purposes. And if you've got pastors saying, if you pray hard enough, God will fill your mouth with gold teeth. If you pray hard enough, and if you're blessed, at me, and you would, you'll be blessed by riches. Um, the Church of Nigeria is basically struggling with uh domestic problems of a, of, a, of a religion that seeks to destroy them, Islam, of an aberrant form of Christianity, the prosperity gospel that seeks to sap and suck out the enthusiastic portion of the church of Nigeria. And there's a problem with younger clergy coming into the church in Nigeria who don't know any better. A few years ago, we had a big stink where a man put forward as bishop was an advocate of the prosperity gospel Matt Kennedy mounted a campaign to prevent this, and the fellow had to basically forswear the prosperity gospel mm -hmm. um, to get to get to be bishop. But it's still in the water in Nigeria. Well, what isn't in the water in Nigeria is the Church of England or Gafcon or yeah. the Global South, and their attention is elsewhere. Well, it's in the water because of uh, the image that a priest riding a bicycle to church uh, versus a, 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 a pastor, a you know, Pentecostal pastor, riding a land cruiser to an air conditioned church. You know, and uh, people see that. And I want the land cruiser life. I don't want the life of sacrifice. And, you know, we quickly lose the message of the gospel when we forget to include that there's sacrifice in the gospel. And there's sacrifice in Christian living. There's sa sacrifice in living a, a redeemed life. And when, when you lose that message up front and you don't teach it to you, you're young, they're going to go for that land cruiser, George. And part of the evil of the Pente of the, I, forgive me, I'm not conflating Pentecostalism and the prosperity gospel. Uh, I'm, yeah, that's, there's a fine I, line. <laughs> yeah. Prosperity gospels, many of them are Pentecostals, but heart, you know, Pentecostals are not all prosperity gospel people. Yeah. So the the prosperity gospel people are saying that well if you are if you did have your house burned down by Muslim terrorists, if your wife is dying of cancer, it's because your faith is not strong enough. You're not a good enough Christian. You have to pray harder, um, which is a terrible terrible thing to tell people because that's not what the gospel says. That only good things happen to Christians and bad things happen to bad people. Well, the but prosperity that's one of the things they're telling us. The, the prosperity gospels people here in America, I don't know what they preach uh, worldwide, say that God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to have no conflict in your life. And um, I can think of Credo Dollar. I can think of Joe Olstein, Kenneth Hagan. You know, their God is not a God of the gospel. Their Jesus is not a Jesus of the gospel. And... Um, I their God, that. yeah, their their God is formed in the same uh, forge that the transgender movement is formed out of. That you know what you want is the measure of all things. Be the you best wanna, you. Yeah, 
And if the best you is to castrate yourself and become a woman, or if it's to basically make millions of dollars, whatever it is, that's God's blessing on you. And that we know is a lie from the Bible. Uh, the scriptures tell us that that's a lie. That's the corruption, and it, yeah. And, and it's all part of, it. well, we talk about what's in the water in Nigeria, it's what's in the water in the United States. Yeah. Um, from you know the, the political movements that seek to destroy men and young boys, to the church movements that seek to rob the gospel of its salvific powers in exchange for prosperity and uh, happiness now. In many ways, the modern Episcopal Church, its leadership has more in common with Joel Osteen than it does with the fathers of the church. Yeah. Oh, boy, George, let's move on to our next one. Um, I've been seeing this recently. Uh, uh, my wife works for a defense contractor. She gets emails all the time from the State Department saying, uh, don't travel to this country. Um, the, the world's kind of falling apart. But we're not going to tell the mainstream press the world's falling apart. We're just going to tell people who may accidentally buy a plane ticket to a country where you're likely to be murdered, if not murdered, raped, if not raped, robbed, if not robbed, kidnapped. And uh, they list these nations. And I, I see some of these nations have Anglican churches, George. And I thought we want, that makes it an Anglican story, if, if anything does. The State Department put, has put out travel advisories for Jamaica, Nassau, the Bahamas, the Turks and Caicos, Belize, um, other tourist destinations in the Caribbean, warning American tourists not to go there because mm -hmm. of rampant crime. What's happening is that the, uh, the cartels are making a fortune smuggling people and they're also smuggling drugs. And one of the transshipment places are the Bahamas, are this are, are uh, Jamaica and things like that. And crime is out of control. And our own government is telling us not to go there, you know, not to walk around Montego Bay after dark, not, not to get off the boat in Nassau. Um, I'm of the age where I get all these emails from cruise lines. I, they think because now I've passed six zo, all I do is stay up at night looking at cruise brochures. I don't, but the, internet thinks I does. And I'm noticing these cruise ships no longer dock in Kingston and Montego Bay. They go, you know, some do, but they go to their own private island in the Bahamas or their private island off the coast of Haiti, where basically you have a Disneyland experience in a foreign country because you, it's not safe. The, the Archdeacon for the Turks and Caicos uh, just put out a, a sermon, which I got, somehow I get these things. And he said, you know, right now the Turks and Caicos has a crime rate worse than Haiti. We're in week seven of the year and there've been seven murders in the Turks and Caicos Islands. It's all drag drug related, it's all gang related, crime is out of control in the Turks and Caicos. And what's happening is that the young people are being seduced by American gang culture, that's what they call it, American gang culture. And the church, is at war with secularity and criminality. And if you look at absolute numbers, it's losing that war. So that the Caribbean, the West Indian churches are in trouble because they, they too, like in Nigeria, have to compete with the Pentecostal movements. Plus they also have to compete with criminal gangs that are taking, siphoning the kids away and promising them, you know, fort why study hard? Why work hard? Why get a trade job when you can live fast and loose on drugs for a year or two till you get killed but nobody thinks they're the ones that are going to be killed mm -hmm. so we're, we're seeing we're i hate to say this but you know nassau is becoming like detroit uh, except no one would ever want to take a cruise ship to detroit well i think we've lost um our heroes uh, our children have no heroes other than uh, TikTok influencers and YouTube influencers. Uh, that you know, the, the heroes that I grew up with were kind of the the end of the astronaut era, uh, the end of the cowboy era, uh, and in the world of politics, 
Uh, but I had people I looked up to who were not uh, giving little uh, three-minute influencer commercials selling Bud Light uh, on YouTube or TikTok. I, I had real people that uh, influenced my life who were heroes. We don't have that anymore. We we now replaced heroes with influencers. Mm-hmm. And the influencers are not just affecting American children. They're affecting children all over the world. Uh, the last time I did international travel uh, to a third country, the third country uh, teenagers and uh, young adults had smartphones. Uh, it's not just something we have in America. Uh, the smartphone has kind of... Uh, used to be an indication of wealth it's now an indication of just communication it's no different than having the newspaper uh, yeah i'm wired into what i call the exorcist world you know the um, catholic world of uh, exorcists and um, and one of the things that i read in the literature is again and again and these these men who have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years where I've been only involved for a year are saying that the pace is quickening. Things are getting worse, not better. Mm -hmm. The demonic influences that are being directed towards young people in particular are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, The, you know, in the sixties, when they had the Charles Manson types of crazies, we could think that would be isolated strangeness. But now just imagine Charles Manson as an influencer on TikTok being watched by a 13-year-old and being led into this weird world that uh, will open the door to the satanic in their life. Um, I want to run down a rabbit hole, if I may, Kevin. Um, uh, I, well, if, if people see the whole rabbit hole, it was good. If not, it was, I just edited it out. Go ahead, George. When we talked about the, uh, the, the bishop who criticized uh, Calvin Robinson, mm-hmm. uh, Alex Farmer, um, and his use of language, I uh, engaged in conversation with a number of people in comments um, where I basically explained what I understood Farmer to mean. And they said, well, George, that's not, you know, you're being overly precise with his language. You're using the standards that you learned rather than American colloquial language. And I think one of the things we need to do in this difficult time is always give the person the benefit of the doubt. Find the best possible interpretation of what they say. Now, you may say, George, will you never do that with Justin Welby? Yes, I'm guilty of that, I know. But in our intercourse with people, um, and with everybody but Justin Welby, George. <laughs> Perhaps we need yeah. to give the people the benefit of the doubt, to realize that people may say things that other people will hear differently from what they mean. And per- an old story, Kevin, you know this story, um, and this goes to the heart of journalism and how journalism has changed as a practice. At the uh, conference, in the, the first Plano conference, way back when, uh, Bob Duncan gave a speech And he likened the crisis of Gene Robinson crisis to the genocide in Rwanda. And I was there as a reporter for the Living Church. And after the, after it was over, uh, Bob Duncan, who was exhausted, you know, he'd been on stage, it was a big night. And Larry Stamers, who was a reporter for the Los Angeles Times, in those days, people cared what happened in the Episcopal Church and the secular press. Larry Stamers had his uh, little cassette recorder, and he asked Bob Duncan, Bishop Duncan, are you saying that the election of a homo- of a gay partnered bishop in New Hampshire is on the same level as the murder and genocide in Rwanda? And Bob Duncan said, yes, and he explained what he meant by that. He wasn't explaining that murder was equal to homosexuality, but as a violation of God's law and whatnot. And Larry Stamer sort of clicked off the thing, said, you know, Bishop, I can't write that because I know that's not what you mean, you know. And so Larry Stamer, when he reported Bishop Duncan's speech, did not report that Bishop Duncan equated genocide with homosexuality. 
even though that's what Bob said, but it's not what he meant. That's right. And I'll, over the years, I've learned that the Larry Stamer, who's retired a long time ago from the LA Times, Ten today in ago. the CNN soundbite world, all you'd hear would be, you know, the outrageous thing that the bishop said rather than what he meant or what he understood. And a good reporter tries to get beyond the, the clickbait to the reality. But hold on. Here's the problem with the, the modern reality is all the words uh, out there have been redefined without our, uh, with our okay or say so. You mm -hmm. know, what it means to be this, 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 and this. All those definitions are gone. What it means to be a woman. What it means to be a man. What it means to be married. What it means to be a citizen. What it means to be a soldier. Everything has been completely redefined or undefined. And as a journalist, you and I are journalists, that's a very difficult uh, ground to cover when the uh, centricity of our language has no definition. It's, yeah. it's happened in the lifetime of people where I can remember as a teenager watching uh, John Cleese on the TV about the time when Life of Brian came out. Sure. With, I, I forget who it was. Uh, oh, uh, but as a conservative evangelical journalist, oh, his name will come to me, Malcolm Muggeridge, I think it was. Okay. Uh, and with a bishop talking and basically a John Cleese coming from a liberal perspective that, you know, they weren't making fun of jesus and christianity they were making fun around it and it was need to be seen in that context and Muggeridge's point was well you can't that's a sacred topic and now john cleese has been canceled he's been canceled by the culture for being too conservative there's that scene in the uh, life of brian where i want uh, to woman, have a baby <laughs> yes where eric idol is a trans transgender person and <laughs> You know, it ends with, you can't be a baby, you don't have a womb. And today, that can't be shown uh, because it is offensive to transgender people. Now, all of a sudden, Eric Idle and John Cleese are on the hard right. Whereas one, whereas in my lifetime and in their lifetimes, they were darlings of the left for their, for their being so outrageous. Mr. Bean, the actor Rowan Atkinson, who does a great uh, uh, mockery of priests is now canceled. You know, n nobody survives this because uh, you are not allowed to make fun of anything, including the mundane. Uh, Ro Rowan Atkinson made great fun of the mundane, and so did uh, the the Monty Python crew, uh, and it was hilarious. It still is in my old boomer brain. You know, and this to me it strikes me. You know, in my old brain, Jerry Seinfeld, the American comedian, who I just adore his work. He's, I think he's a great comedian. He was on a college camp at re campus recently, and he did a Q&A, and the questions were, why weren't there more black characters in Seinfeld, and why do you support Israel? And, you know, it's like, come on, people, get a life. Uh -huh. uh, oh, my. Well, that's that's kind of the world we in. Uh, George, we have really run out of time here. Uh, why don't we just talk about the last story? Uh, and you want to talk about the ACNA survives, and it it survived Muir Calvin. And uh, I mean, there's truth to that because uh, early on in the, the formation of the ACNA, there was always going to be an elephant in the room, and that was the women's orders. Uh, does it belong in the ACNA or doesn't it belong? Does the ACNA need to restart and do its own study and have a prohibition on women's orders until that study is conducted? And where will the bishops be in one year, five years, ten years down the road? Uh, will they see the light and, and uh, uh, dissolve women's orders within the church? And you and I have followed this. We've sat there and watched uh, it's slowly well, cover from diocese to diocese, and there are very, I don't want to say liberal, but I'm going to say liberal dioceses within uh, the ACNA and very conservative diocese within the ACNA. But I'm 10 years from the formation of the ACNA. The ACNA is definitely more conservative than it was 10 years ago, but they maintain and uh, allow for the ordination of women, George. I'll quibble on one point. 
And when oh. the ACNA was formed 10 years ago, if you look at the videos, there were three elephants in the room. You, me, and the wound <laughs> order. Thank you. Uh, yes. But we have lost, if you look at our, if you we look both at lost we started, weight. You lost weight, we I lost weight. both lost a great deal of weight. <laughs> uh, so, friends, we're not going to drop dead on you. We'll be here a long time. Oh, boy. You're right. I think you're absolutely right. Um, now, when, uh, now there are rumors that are, you know, rumors are always going to be out there that, oh, a, a parish in the Anglican Diocese of the South is thinking of joining the, one of the continuing churches. Or, oh, there's a, a C4SO parish that once has joined the Episcopal Church. There will always be these in and outs on the sidelines. But as an institution, I think the ACNNA has been able to form a remarkable identity that is preventing it from falling apart. You're right. Hurricane Calvin was the perfect storm, and social media was full of this is the time, this is the issue, this is now it's going to happen, this is Lexington, this is Concord, and Calvin's Paul Revere riding out to warn that the British are coming. Well, no, it's not. Um, we've survived this. I don't see any indication of any cracks anywhere. And I think it's part of, part of the the fabric of the ACNA, that it knows that this problem is there and it works deliberately to find a way to rise above it, to see the best in all the bishops. Mm -hmm. And if this were the Episcopal Church, uh, there would be a bishop every Sunday would be lambasting uh, Bishop Hunter, Todd Hunter. Or every Sunday there would be a bishop lambasting the Bishop of Fort Worth you know, for not agreeing with what I think. The ACNA doesn't do that. And I think those Christian, I mean, if we look, we've been going through First Peter in our, a recent Bible study sure. at okay. church. And one of the things is that uh, when you're amongst Christians, you don't, they're not, other Christians are not Amalekites to be smote hip and thigh in argument and debate. That one of the things that people said, oh, well, Calvin was just like Jesus chasing the money changers out of the temple or confronting the Pharisees. Well, that analogy only works if you believe that your opponents on the issue of women's orders, whether you're for it or against it, are Pharisees or are heretics. So if Bob you believe Duncan, they're misguided who, fellow Christians, yeah, then you yeah. treat them with love and compassion yeah. and kindness. Yeah. I and there's that reality is there was a, a rule, an unspoken rule. I heard the rule, because it clearly wasn't completely unspoken, that in the formation of the ACNA, bishops were not allowed to criticize other bishops publicly. That this would be, the ACNA going forward would be topical. You can discuss any topic, just don't name names. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with you talking about uh, how much you love or disdain women's orders. We don't, that's not a big deal don't bring up other people's names when you do it. And, you know, that's why you and I kind of get heartburn sometimes when we read a, a woke paper by a bishop and uh, we get to name names because we're not bishops. Uh, but and I'm not in the ACNA. <laughs> and you're, not, you're not even in the ACNA. And so there is that, but the reality is that has helped a church not just survive, but thrive. The ACNA compared to so many other denominations, uh, except for Pro Prosperity Gospel, uh, is thriving right now. We're watching the collapse of uh, the, the liberal portion of uh, the Methodist Church. We're watching the, the, the collapse of the Episcopal Church. Uh, Canadian Church won't even put their numbers out. I mean, that's bad. And in doing so, you're allowing the ACNA which is growing to continue to thrive and say, Hey, and they don't say, look at us, but they sit and say, it's working, you know, and it is working. Um, now I love Calvin Robinson. I only agree with two things he said in that, uh, um, thing, uh, he, he did for the mere Anglicanism. I don't, I, the Luther thing was completely bizarre to me but you know he's allowed to say it because it was topical 
Uh, some people thought it was the, uh, the uh, one up by land, two up by sea. It wasn't. It was not. George, we've done a long show. Uh, when it's finally edited, I'll try and you know, keep it down under four hours. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 844 of Anglican Unscripted.